tell you about this big monitor project that I'm working on. And I'm going to start with the problem, the basic problem we're addressing. And it's one that folks in this room will know well, that most of the poorest women on the planet give birth at home, often without experience support. And as a result, uh, too many mothers and babies die every year. Uh, but we know that early intervention works. Uh, antenatal care and treatment in the first days and weeks postpartum can prevent two-thirds of newborn deaths. And the same thing with maternal deaths. Eighty percent of maternal deaths can be prevented uh, with a set of proven interventions that are delivered by a uh, skilled attendant. But the problem for many women is that they delay the decision to seek care, not always because of their own volition, but their husbands don't make it a priority. They don't know uh, that they're experiencing complications. And they also delay in, in reaching care. Uh, money's not available for transport. The roads are bad. It's a long distance to the, to the clinic. Um, we can dispatch community health workers to, uh, or, or skilled attendants to go to their home. Uh, but the problem is that for many women, a mobile signal is much more likely to reach their home than a skilled attendant or a community health worker. And, and this is the basic idea on which our project is built. Because we know that, I can finish that slide. Um, I was going to say that we know that uh, uh, mobile phone penetration in Kenya is quite high. Um, in, in, in the 70s, 80s uh, percent. Uh, so why not take clinical screening and direct it to the mothers? If they're having a hard time getting into the clinic and we don't have enough community health workers to make it out to them, uh, why not go directly to them with a mobile screening service? And that's what Baby Monitor does. So we're taking uh, clinical screening directly to mothers uh, in that critical period before and after delivery. So the phone application that I'm going to tell you about uses something called interactive voice response technology uh, to detect these complications and take action. It sounds fancy, but you all know what it is. If you've ever called Time Warner and they say, you know, to speak with an operator, press 1. Um, to be really frustrated, press 2. Uh, that's the service. Now, you might have negative associations with a service like that. Uh, we don't have the same connotations in Kenya, but that's the basic uh, software uh, behind the system. So what happens is women are listening to these screening questions and they respond, uh, uh, the screening questions are in their local language and they respond by pressing keys on their phone. And it's a most basic phone. It's not an iPhone like I'm using here or an Android. It's just a basic, low cost Nokia phone that are everywhere in Kenya. What happens is on the server side is baby monitor assesses their responses uh, and if necessary sends information, uh, makes a referral or dispatches help. And I'm going to tell you about how it works. But if you think of this three-delay model, and the folks familiar with maternal health will know this three-delay model, that there are delays in, again, women deciding to seek care, reaching care, and then receiving high-quality care once they do make it to the clinic. Baby Monitor is going to address um, certainly the first one and some of the second one. So um, helping women to know that they should be seeking care and helping men to connect them to care. So the components are, are, are pretty basic here, even though it is uh, an interesting technology. So we have an electronic medical record system in the cloud. We have this interactive voice response system. We're using a, and I'll tell you more about it, we're using a system called Revoice uh, from a group called Instead. It's an open source free platform. And all we need is a woman at her rural home with a basic uh, Nokia phone, of course a medical phone. I, I should say, you should feel free to stop me if you have questions at any point. Um, I'll keep going until then, and we'll leave time at the end. But if you have a question, go ahead and feel free to, to ask it. Here's the basic schematic of how it works, and I'm going to break it down. Yeah? Um, did you have trouble getting um, IRB approval for um, medical records in the cloud? We didn't. We didn't. Um, it's, it's pretty secure. Uh, like banking, it's uh, hosted on an Amazon <coughs> server. And um, it's the same things that, that banks use. It, it's, it's, quite, it's quite secure. Um, and uh, I, I think at this stage, there's, there's few regulations around it in, in other countries as well. So we didn't have a regulatory bur uh, hurdle to overcome. So uh, what happens is the system for voice uh, sends out uh, screening questions on the protocol. right? And um, we have the benefit of being able to pull from a medical record in the cloud. So after we've made calls to women, you know, 
know, the first time, we know that if they told us that they were having a fever or they were experiencing nausea. So when we call them the next time, we're able to tap into their medical record and say, you know, last time you said you were experiencing a fever. How are you feeling now? Uh, so asking questions very much in a tree structure. Does your baby still have a cough? Press one if yes, press two if no. Then the system, what happens is it can detect the, uh, the number that the woman is pressing over the voice call. It doesn't require a data connection of any kind. When a woman presses one or when she presses two, the system can detect over the voice call the difference in the tones. So it knows if the woman pressed a one or pressed a two, and it logs that in the database. And then we can write script, which I'll show you, that analyzes her results. So breaking it down, uh, we have this for voice platform. Uh, I'll show you how I, I set it up. It's a simple web interface that allows you to go in and design these calls. So we didn't have to start from scratch. Uh, we were able to focus on maternal health and infant health questions and let instead uh, give us the web interface for, for voice. It works with any voice over IP line. So in Kenya, we work with a group called Access Kenya. Uh, they connect to the major telecom provider called Safaricom, and that's what powers our phone calls to the limit. And as I said, that we're able to pull from uh, the medical record in the cloud to know the woman's history. And it's odd in, in the sense that uh, for some of these women, our system will be the first time that a medical provider is remembering them from time one to time two. Even though uh, so we're, you know, we're a cold machine, uh, we're able to remember what they said last time and bring that up in the next call to the woman. So women receive these voice calls. Uh, and again, it's on this basic uh, Nokia phone. And they listen to these pre-recorded screening questions uh, that are pre-recorded in Swahili. Uh, in the future version, will allow them to pick between English or Swahili. Um, and they, the questions are all in a tree structure. So you know, if yes, press one. If no, press two. And then <coughs> based on the response to that question, she'll receive another question. Yeah. I'm sorry if I missed this. Do you give them the phones, or do they already have them? Well, for this trial, which I'm going to tell you about our formative work, okay. uh, we provided them with these basic phones. They're about $12 a piece. Okay. We wanted to um, uh, reduce all the confidence as we could in the study. So her voice automatically logs the woman's responses and it stores all of her information in this uh, medical record system. So once the, once the data is in the medical record system, then we can write a script to do something with it. So right now our script says, if, you know, if the woman's reporting an emergency, what we want you to do is connect the call directly to our clinical partner, which is Jacaranda Health. So if a woman's reporting an emergency and she says, I can't uh, go to get help right now, then we connect her directly to the clinic. So the call just routes, uh, changes its routing. And we have this code that can run automatically and send us alerts You know, when a woman says that she's bleeding, um, and any of the symptoms that might indicate um, a real problem. What it also allows us to do is prevent loss to follow-up. Um, in, in the next year, we'll be moving out to Western Kenya and uh, trying this in a different setting. And we'll be focusing a lot on this follow-up issue. Um, if we send a health worker, we can automate the process so we follow up with the health system the next day, you know, did you send the health worker? And we can do the same thing with a woman, sending the woman the message the following day, did someone come to see you? Because uh, that's what was referred. If no, then we can follow up with the health system to figure out why not. And if a woman says no, no one came to visit them, we can ask how they're feeling now and how we can get them help. So there are a few key features that I want to run through. This idea of mothers as end users, um, the fact that the system can remember women from one time to another. It's a voice platform, not text. And if you're dealing with um, um, a really rural, poor population, the literacy is going to be an issue. So we decided to go with a voice platform, and it's interoperable. So this idea of mothers as end users, uh, there are a lot of other groups out there right now making great applications for uh, community health workers, mobile phone applications to help them do their jobs better. And it's great. Uh, but, the, but the problem is there are not enough community health workers out there to meet the demand. So while we think what they're doing is really good, we're trying to go directly to mothers uh, as the users of our product. The system also remembers uh, 
women. So if you're in a clinic where you have paper records and you have no efficient way of recalling those records from one visit to the next, um, and your health system is overburdened, you have a hard time giving real personalized care. And in a sense, as I said, uh, our system is able to offer that because we can remember quite easily <coughs> what a woman told us from one, one visit to the next. Uh, text message programs are quite common, but again, if you're dealing with a population where illiteracy is an issue, um, having people respond via text message is not going to be the best uh, form of communication. So for us, we have women listening to these uh, questions uh, verbally, and they were responding by uh, key press. This last idea that it's interoperable, meaning that Baby Monitor, because it's an open source program, uh, and the data uh, architecture is designed in a way that the data can move freely from Vervoice to any other system that's out there, um, it's easy to connect to programs issuing patient reminders and health promotion. Uh, to other clinic health information systems and other tools for community health workers. We're not trying to have one solution that, that solves every problem. I told you we're focusing on those first two delays, right? and our, our system is designed to then be plugged in to a larger health uh, information system. So let me tell you what we're working on now, um, and, and then what we're going to get into. The first phase of our work uh, this year in uh, Nairobi is uh, is the human-centered design. We're trying to get the screening process right and understand everything that could be going wrong, uh, why women don't answer the calls, why they don't understand it, what all the reasons for our failure can be. Let me show you a little bit about how we started developing the program without even um, hiring a designer. One of the first steps in the development process, something called Wizard of Oz testing. This is where we, without building anything, we mock up what the system would look like calling the women. So we have our wizard, Edwin, our project mm -hmm. manager in Kenya. Here's our woman, Lisper. She's volunteering for this call. Edwin and I are sitting in one room, connected by Skype to our volunteer who's in a separate room. Edwin's pretending to be a computer, and he only knows what to say when I tell him what to say. And my responses are based on what Lisper's inputting into the computer. She thinks Edwin is a real computer. She doesn't know he's a real person. It is normal for women to experience vaginal discharge after giving birth, but some discharge is a sign that you should see a nurse. Since you gave birth, have you experienced any vaginal discharge that had a bad odor? If yes, press 1. If no, press 2. After the test, we pull back the curtain and get her feedback on the process. Now what this helped us to do was figure out all the problems we might encounter before hiring an expensive software developer to come in and design a process that's not going to work. Um, we learned in our very first interview that um, women would not want to sit through all of our questions if they had a real emergency to report. So we had to re redesign the entire call flow based on a few of these interviews where the women said, how about you give us an opportunity to say whether or not we're experiencing a problem and tell you about that problem first rather than tell, uh, tell you about what you want to hear first. And that was a great insight, and we would have lost a lot of money hiring a software developer to develop the other way around. Right now, we're doing formative research with uh, uh, 90 women who were uh, recruited to be in their third semester, their third trimester when the <coughs> study started, so they were in their second trimester when they were recruited. And our main questions are whether the system um, is feasible to implement, uh, acceptable to the women, uh, whether the results are reliable and, and accurate. I'll tell you about those. We're delivering screening calls um, uh, along Kenya's uh, focused antenatal program. Uh, the schedule is 90 days, 60 days, and 30 days before delivery. And then uh, after delivery, we're doing it on days 1, 3, and 7. And then following the immunization schedule at 6, 10, 14 weeks. So we're trying to schedule the calls uh, at periods where the women should be interacting with the health system already. Uh, later on, we're going to be extending these calls through the developmental period. And we want to be able to follow these uh, uh, new kids uh, through the first <coughs> two years. The screening content uh, is, covers uh, maternal physical health, so things like fever, nausea, cramping, uh, perinatal depression. Uh, there are not many studies that are looking at perinatal depression, and we're including that in, in our screening. Uh, infant health, of course, and uh, infant development. We're using the uh, 
if you're familiar with developmental screenings, uh, the ages and stages uh, screening questionnaire. So what we do is um, we give a call to the woman on one day. When she completes the call, the following day, she's asked to report to the clinic to receive an in-person screening. So the in-person screening with the nurse is our gold standard. And we need to compare what happens over the phone on the call to the gold standard uh, evaluation with the nurse. And what happens is both sources of information dump into the database and we're able to compare the results over the phone and in person with the nurse. The first thing we have to establish is reliability. We have to make sure that the women are telling us the same thing over the phone as they're telling it to the nurse. Right? If they say over the phone they're having a fever, they should all be also be telling the nurse that they have a fever, things like that. It's the idea that when you step on a scale, if you're familiar with psychometrics, uh, reliability, if you step on a scale, you want the scale to tell you the same thing if you step on and off. Right? You want it to give you the same measurement if nothing has changed about you. And by doing these calls one day apart, uh, doing a call and having a woman come in, nothing has really changed, and we want to be sure that the woman is telling us the same thing. So that would mean our scale is uh, reliable if they give the same information. Validity has um, been saying, um, does our screen accurately predict women who need, who are high and low need? So what we do here is we're comparing to our gold standard. If, uh, if the nurse is rating a woman as being in high or moderate need of help, we should also be able to determine from our screening questions uh, that a woman needs help. Again, our, our, our goal is to go out to rural areas and um, bring care to, uh, to women who otherwise wouldn't be able to reach care. If they're able to make it in to the clinic, they're not our target population. But the women we're trying to reach are the ones that would not naturally uh, or easily make it into the clinic. And what we want to do is try to replicate that clinical screening process. So um, in the formative work, we're trying to establish that if a nurse says a woman is in high need, our screening can also determine that she's in high need. So we're trying to calibrate our algorithm for determining high need with what a nurse would consider high need. All we have to work with are her screening responses. A nurse has a physical examination, and the assessment that she's doing, and you know, her intuition. And we're seeing how well we can predict um, what she's going to say. You know, and, and this gets to issues of you know, sensitivity and specificity. So uh, again, for folks who are familiar with psychometric, sensitivity is um, able to, to screen out these high need cases, and specificity is these, uh, these uh, low need cases. In the second year, we're looking to go out to Western Kenya and do a larger trial with about 300 women. And have some women get the program, some women not get the program, or at least put them on a delayed schedule. And look at what the impact of a baby monitor is on getting women into care early and often. Um, we'll need, eventually, a much larger trial, probably 4,000, 5,000 women, to be able to look at the impact on health outcomes that approach um, things like mortality. We need a much larger sample size to be able to measure that with um, any precision. But our first step really is this formative work, proving that it uh, has proof of concept. We have two years of funding from this program called Saving Lives of Earth, which is funded by uh, USAID, the Gates Foundation, and a few other donors, including the World Bank. Two years of funding uh, through this grand challenge to prove proof of concept. And if we do that, uh, we can be eligible to try to get the funding we would need to go up to this larger, uh, this larger trial. A few thoughts about mHealth, because I know a lot of you are interested in that. My, my experience is that mHealth is often oversold as um, sort of the savior of, of uh, under-resourced health systems. What we need is evidence. If you uh, read a lot of the systematic reviews, and there have been about four or five now, um, uh, they're a little depressing towards the end. They basically conclude there aren't enough studies to really make firm conclusions. Um, uh, I think that's because the technology is only now to the point where we can start establishing really high quality trials. Up until now, people have been doing a lot of pilot testing that has not transitioned uh, to full trials. You have to remember also that the phone is only a tool. Um, we try to put the process and people first and think of the tone as a, that the phone is a way to um, facilitate our work. It's, it's not the cornerstone of our work. And it's tough reporting to a donor like this, but 
uh, this is partly what sold them on our project, that we really view failure as part of uh, our process here. Uh, it would be unrealistic to think that when we develop the screening the first time, then we'd be perfectly right, and it's not. Uh, we have women that, um, when they get a call, and it says, you know, are you experiencing a fever? Uh, yes. You know, we, we said, press one if you're experiencing a fever. Yes, I'm experiencing a fever. Um, and they don't understand, and the call eventually times out, and we call them back and say, no, why didn't, you know, why weren't you responding to questions? And they said, I was. You know, you asked me if I had a fever, and I was telling you. Um, in other cases, our, our calls aren't going through, and we're noticing that a week goes by, and we're not getting through to the woman, and we make a visit to the house, and you know, the husband says, I have no idea who you are, um, so I blocked the number. Um, I didn't recognize the number coming in, so it's now blocked. Now, when we get further along and we're a little bit bigger, we can have a, a code that will properly identify us in an incoming call. Um, but for right now, that, that's been an issue in some cases. So we've had to go out and, again, explain the study to the rest of the family and get everybody on board. But we run into lots of things like that. Um, but failure is just part of, uh, part of this process. And a lot of mobile health uh, work ha has not given enough lead time and enough uh, time for iterative cycles right, to figure out what's wrong, to fix it, and to try it again. And we're really trying to do that uh, in our working opinion right now. Let me show you just a little bit about uh, what the voice looks like. Uh, because it is free, my class, I'm teaching a technology and health class, and the, uh, we have stu three student teams working on projects. Some of them are mobile health, and uh, a few of the groups are using for voice, and they already have it up and running. This is a typical call flow. What you see here are different steps. So here would be um, the step where we say, you know, hi, this is a SIA nurse uh, in Swahili. Hi, this is a SIA from Baby Monitor. You know, are we speaking with the woman who signed up for Baby Monitor? If yes, press one. If no, uh, press three. Um, <laughs> like I said, I'm supposed to be a few places right now. <laughs> um, if the woman answers, um, she's indicating um, whether or not she has time to talk. If not, it goes through the whole call flow about when should we call you back. Um, if she answers and she has time to talk, um, is she experiencing a problem? If she's experiencing a problem, um, is are she able to um, uh, get to the health clinic now? If not, then should we send help? And, and we do that. Then, if nothing's wrong and we can proceed with the, with the screening, we get down here um, to our first <coughs> screening question, with this, which is about nausea. And you'll see over on the right, um, this, is where, uh, this is where you program uh, all of your questions in. So we have the Swahili first and the English second. It sounds like this. Katika siku tatu zilizopita, umekuwa na hali yoyote mbaya ya kuchafuka roho kiasi cha kutaka kutapika au kutapika. So we have... Kama ndiyo... We have a Swahili speaker go through and record all of the prompts. <coughs> and it's quite long and quite big because uh, a woman can go uh, many different directions in, in the branch. But what's great is um, instead has uh, done the hard work of programming all of this. All we had to do was go in through their um, visual interface and design it like this. Now, where our coding comes in, um, is in a program called R. So all of our data sits on uh, this Amazon server. And we've written code in a free program called R, which I know some of you use, and it sits on the server as well. And the computer is programmed so that it runs every 10 minutes. Right? And it can, re it can screen uh, women's responses and figure out women that might need help in real time. Now, in the first phase, we're not acting on that information, but we're just seeing how the process works. In the next phase, we'll be able to have almost real-time uh, screening of the results as they come in. Which, for a lot of folks who are statisticians, um, that's not something that usually happens in studies. Oftentimes, you're waiting until the end of a trial to get the information to come in. Then there's a lot of cleaning, and it takes a while till you get to the results. Um, what we've sort of uh, established for ourselves for the next phase is being ready to go from day one and to have these on the screen. What I want to do is, uh, is then to pause here and uh, see what questions you have for me. Yeah. Um, one, are the calls paid for? And also, uh, is there any incentive for getting these women to basically double the amount of time and energy investment they are doing into their health care? 
especially one day right after another day. I'll ask for clarification in your second part, but uh, uh, the cost is free to the women. In Kenya, as in many uh, countries outside of the U.S., uh, incoming calls. <laughs> What's that? Every country. Yeah, I, I, probably every country. Uh, incoming calls are free. So the women are receiving a call from our system. Uh, one of the biggest feature requests is the women want to be able to uh, flash the system, which means call the number and then hang up and not pay anything so that they can then trigger a call to them. What we're finding is we don't have the ability for that feature right now. So we call women and we get them rescheduling over and over again because they're in the market, it's too noisy, they can't hear, they don't want to do the screening at that particular time. We're trying to accommodate them generally, but the scheduling is not that precise. So in the next round, we'll developing, be developing the op uh, option for women to schedule their own calls. Your second so, question. Um, you said that <coughs> they have to go through this process one day and do all that for this beginning trial phase. That's right. They have to do all that process, but then they also have to travel and make it to a clinic and see someone yep. the next day. So is there anything to encourage them to actually follow through with both of those? Yeah, definitely. We, we recruited from uh, recruited from neighborhoods around our clinical partner. Mm -hmm. So one, it's pretty close. We do also provide a transportation refund and the clinic which is uh, a really high quality clinic in Kenya, is providing free care. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of incentives for women to participate in the study itself. Um, so there's uh, about your voice prompts. Mm -hmm. Which language are they mainly uh, coded in? Uh, so this is in English. Uh, the next version of her voice, <coughs> which will be out soon, will allow you to have any languages in there. And a woman would be able to, the first call, um, say which language is her preference and then that would be remembered in the next call. So the next <coughs> time we run this, we'll have it in English and Swahili, which has been the main request. But we could program it in a, any language. Because uh, if your target population is mainly the rural women, mm -hmm. most of the time they speak their vernacular language. Mm -hmm. so yeah, when we move out um, to the more rural areas, we can re-record everything um, in the local, local vernacular. Yep. Yep. Is, it, is your end user ideally women receiving antenatal care or women who don't receive antenatal care? Um, so we're, we're not trying to take women out of the system. That would be the opposite of, uh, have the opposite effect of what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to reach women eventually who are unlikely to make it all the way through from all their antenatal visits and their postnatal visits. In Kenya, um, antenatal visits are quite high. A lot of women finish the full uh, course. Postnatal care is where attendance really drops off. Um, so we think that by establishing a relationship with women through the phone in the antenatal period, even if they are women who might also make it to the clinic, uh, they might not be the ones uh, making it to their postnatal care. So by developing that relationship, we can encourage them to continue uh, interacting with the system. I can see the value as far as learning how to do the system, being in the urban environment where they're going to get care, you're basically learning how to do it. So eventually as you move more rurally where right. people can't get to the clinic, you can find out who you need to go get. Uh, that's right. That's right. You know, we community health workers play this important role, but there just aren't enough of them. So if we could um, help to optimize where they're sent, right? If we can help to know that which women really need assistance, if our screening tool is has you know positive predictive uh, ability, and we can predict women who are going to need that additional assistance, and we can help to make better use of those community health workers, I think we'll make a nice positive impact. Uh, what happens with women, especially in very rural areas that don't have previous medical records? So all of the women. Um, Right now, the way it's set up, that our, for our call is the first record for them. Um, you know, any any medical system could adopt this. You know, AMPAC, which you probably hear a lot about in this program, has a very large medical record system. This is designed to be able to tap into AMPAC. So if you were using it in an AMPAC system, you could tap into their medical record system. For us, uh, each call is the first. The first call is the first medical record. And I mean, and, all right. In theory, you, you could create a system that could be accessed by women that you didn't approach, and, and in fact, like, multiple women could, could use the same, could share, and multiple families could share one phone and use a like, medical record number to, to access your service? Yeah, the, the access code has actually been a hard thing. Um, so we designed it in the beginning to have them enter a PIN number. 
Um, many women were confusing their PIN number for our system with the PIN number for M-Pesa, which is a medical, uh, or sorry, a, a banking system in Kenya, confusing it with um, their, their normal phone PIN. So it's been really hard to get women to enter a PIN consistently and correctly. Um, we've tried other, we're going to try other things like having them remember keywords and having them pick from a list. So um, vegetables, produce, fruit. And there's some combination of those that if they remember those, they'll be able to access the system. Right now, there's no security on it. That when they get the call, they can proceed with the screening. As you move into the rural, more rural stage, how um, how is that going to affect the process of the emergency care situation? So you said they could request someone to come, or you could send someone. How? Where are those people coming from in the rural situation? Well, you still have that delay in reaching care, right? And, and we're, we're banking on the fact that, um, that in the next five years, where you're going to see the growth is in the mobile phone space. Right? So these signals are going to get out to more women. More women are going to have access to phones. Then the health, uh, then the government is going to scale up the use of community health workers and the supply of community health workers. So we think that even though all women don't have uh, phones at the moment, it's a good bet that in five years we'll see much better coverage there and the government won't make as much progress on the community health worker side. Um, so for the community health workers that do exist, we can try to optimize their use, right? We're sending them. Um, sometimes it's women don't know that they should be seeking care. So they could have transportation, but they don't know that they should go. But if they can complete our screening and the screening suggests that, you know, it, it's been validated and now it suggests that they should go to seek care, a referral might be enough. One thing we're going to try is this idea of communities of care. So if a woman is willing, we'd sign up um, her husband, um, her sister, her pastor, whoever in the community she wants, so that when we get her screening results, uh, we can send it to them as well to say, you know, it really looks like um, Martha should go to the clinic. Um, uh, you really need to be helping her to get there because the results suggest that she may be experiencing a complication. One of the problems women say they have is convincing their husbands who are controlling the purse strings that there's a need to go to the hospital, which usually means a big expense. So if we can somehow help in that process by being you know, the authority of sorts and, and reaching out to the husbands, reaching out to the sister to say, you know, there really could be an issue here and you should help her to get to the clinic. Um, I'm hoping that communities of care idea can overcome a transportation barrier, what would typically be seen as a transportation barrier, without any additional money. That would be a small behavioral nudge that if it worked, you know, could we increase the women who are making to the clinic without any additional inputs of cash? I come from an area in the U.S. with pretty high postnatal morbidity and mortality, so I was wondering if you see this technology as something that could be adopted by other health systems elsewhere in the world and even maybe here in the U.S. in the future. It could. Um, one thing we're looking at in the study is we have about equal numbers of first-time mothers and experienced mothers and I, I think that the system will end up being most, my hypothesis is it will be most useful um, for first-time mothers, particularly those eventually in rural areas. Um, that you're, you're giving these women um, who have not been through the experience before information. If they're really rural and disconnected, um, this information could be a real lifeline. For mothers in the U.S. that might have other sources of information, an IVR um, approach might be more annoying. Like we may not be able to get the same um, user satisfaction in the U.S. as we could get in a place like Kenya, where um, if they had other sources of information, they would take it. But since they don't, you know, they'll sit through a 20-minute screening call. I'm not sure we can get mothers in the U.S. Um, if I think about the, the big risk for perinatal mortality, I'm going to see effects on that. Do you foresee screening for things like diabetics and preeclamptics or like a response for hemorrhages, or do you see it as that sort of before and screening or a response after? Yeah, um, you know, a lot of your drivers of maternal mortality we can't address. You know, if a woman is hemorrhaging, you know, the, the call is too late for that. But if we can detect symptoms of preeclampsia, you know, leading up to that time, then we might be able to get the woman into care earlier. Um, but if she's having an emergency at the time of, of, of delivery, 
we, we won't be able to do anything about that. And we, we might be able to eventually help have an emergency line that the women can connect to. Um, but as for the screening process, that really won't touch it. And I, you know, and I hope that, um, that we're able to do something really interesting on perinatal depression and childhood. <coughs> Those are two things that are not screened for uh, routinely. Um, to be able to talk to women before and after their delivery and to ask them these uh, questions about depression and also anxiety. Uh, to develop a good screening to try to identify women that might be uh, suffering from depression. Now, the problem in a place like Kenya is there are very few resources then for delivering care. So that's another stream of research to be focusing on. There are some people out there doing it now. Um, the, the lady health worker model is a good one, trying to use lay health workers to deliver um, these uh, interventions for depression. What I think we can do, just like we're doing with community health workers, is try to connect those lay health workers with these women who might be at risk for depression. And for child development, that's certainly something that um, most doctors and nurses aren't asking about. Uh, in fact, we have a question that it says, you know, when you lay your baby on, the ba on, on, on its back, does it, you know, wiggle its arms and legs at, at two months? And mothers came in and said, um, you know, I, I have not been putting my baby on its back. You know, so some of the developmental questions mm -hmm. are not calibrated correctly. So this formative work is really helping us to figure out um, how to ask <laughs> these developmental questions that have been you know, extensively pre-tested and validated here in the U.S., but not as much in Kenya. And I'd really like to see that be part of the primary care process. Yeah, Eric, I, I agree with you about the mental health. The one out of ten women usually have postpartum depression, right? So we, we need which women to send somebody to the house rather than, okay, everything's going fine. It doesn't have to be with every delivery and it doesn't have to be just with the first, so uh, that would be a great intervention to help, help those moms. Mm -hmm. I, I think so. And, and again, by, by, hope, by establishing this relationship in the, in the prenatal period, uh, I hope that we could connect with women who are possibly suffering from postnatal depression uh, and whose children may not be uh, on target developmentally. That they'd be willing to engage with our service. Um, you may have said this before, I'm sorry, I um, Why did you choose Kenya as your site? Um, one, it's uh, high mobile penetration, so a lot of folks have cell phones, the signals are great. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a low cost system to operate in. Uh, I previously worked for the Population Council, and we have a large office in Nairobi. Um, all of those factors came together to suggest Kenya. We looked at India as well and in uh, Nigeria. Rates of infant mortality are quite high in uh, Nigeria, but a little harder to operate in Nigeria. Eric, can you talk more about M Health as a field? Sure. Uh, and particularly because it is such a hot field that you see so much garbage that comes across your desk. <laughs> and, you, and you don't know what, you know, what, and that happens with new fields, so I don't think that's surprising, but and you have a nicely experienced. Uh, expressed up there. Um, so what are the big research questions? Is it more, I mean, what you're doing is increasing access, right? So is the big question more around that? What's the best way to get better access? Or are the questions more around technology? Or are the questions more about how populations respond? to technology? I, I'm trying to get an understanding of the field. Not, not I mean, I mean, your study is great, but I, I don't mean just your study. What what are the real priorities in health? I, I think what everybody wants to see now is to get beyond that line that you see in, in most of these articles saying there's real promise in technology. Right, that's what I meant people, are, people are tired now of reading about the promise of M-Health, so I've, I've removed it from anything I write. <laughs> <laughs> What people want to see is evidence, particularly my on health outcomes. Um, they want to see that we can deliver care more efficiently, uh, more effectively, and that as a result of that, then it leads to um, uh, a decrease in symptoms and better overall outcomes. But does that mean, and is that, but to get that, are people more concerned about a better phone, a better way of using the phone, the way people use phones? Or is the question more, are we asking the right questions on the phone? Are we getting, you know, is it an access question? I'm just trying to get a feel for, to get at the health outcome question, 
what are the areas that are most important to explore now? If you were if you were talking to a graduate student, what what would you say are the most important things they should research? Um, human behavior, psychology. Um, most of the problems we have are not technology related. It's getting women to answer the phone, to be able to get them at a time when it's uh, appropriate for them to take a call, to get them to understand our screening questions, to be able to enter their responses, um, and then to be able to do something on the health system side with the women that need care. So if we just do a great job figuring out which women need to be referred and which need women need to have a health care worker get out to them, now we need to work with the health system to help them get their operations together so they can send women out. But the, the, the big issue is this user experience. Um, I would say to graduate students that you should be really focusing on things like human-centered design. Um, I, I don't know if Duke has as much of this, but MIT, uh, Stanford, Harvard, they have these design labs, and it's really bringing design into the early process of, so we often hear research design, um, but we're thinking of sort of product and user design. Um, what is a woman's experience of using this system? Right? We do exit interviews after uh, most of the calls and trying to figure out what are the barriers to the woman using the phone. It's, if you think that, that M Health is about the technology, uh, you're very wrong. It's, it's about the users and all the unintended consequences um, of using this technology. And where people really get into trouble is when they put the phone first and uh, you give all the promise of the phone. We just had the BBC come out and I think it aired on the BBC last night. They did a feature on Baby Monitor. Um, I'm hoping to see it today. My biggest fear is that they're going to be describing it as what phones can do. And again, the phone is sort of like a bit player here. I'm happy that it exists. It's, it's making it possible. But it's, it's all about um, uh, human behavior and uh, our ability to you know, deliver this effective screening and to analyze the results in a timely manner. Um, but I'm worried that they're going to so do we know, just one more follow-up, yeah. do we know from other uses of the phone in marketing of products or you know, can we learn from other fields uh, that might be useful to us? Because we're not using these phones, to, I'm sure other people are using this technology and this approach to market products or you know, to get people to do other things and go to a healthcare board. Mm -hmm. so is this, you know, are, 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 we, are we able to learn from that? Well, you know, I, I think what, what we're doing is really uh, some of the first of its, of its kind in taking these um, two-way screenings that we're asking something and a woman is responding directly to an end user. Um, most of the work that's been done focuses on that intermediary, uh, the community health worker, helping them to do their job better. And we're trying to just bypass that and go directly to the woman. So there isn't much out there, I think, that can guide us in that in that work. And that's why I think we got funded initially is because of the emphasis on you know, this, this personalized care. Do you then see more future going, future in this field going direct to the mother as opposed to improving these technology, like diagnostic tools for people in the field? Yeah, for, for instance, uh, one of the teams in my uh, uh, technology for health class is uh, working on a study that could complement something that I'm starting in Kenya now. Uh, with TB screenings. We're going to be giving uh, alerts and reminders to doctors and nurses uh, based on information in a person's medical record. Um, if they've missed screening for fever, if they've missed an x-ray, it's prompting a doctor to make sure that um, the patients are moving through the treatment cascade for TB. But we're leaving out an entire half of the equation and that's the patient. Um, now it's going to be tough in Kenya, but what if the patient um, stepped into a kiosk that's operated just by a basic mobile phone and was able to hear the same reminder that the doctor was going to get so the patient can also bring it up with the doctor. Right? So trying to go directly to the patient with the same thing that we're doing to the doctor to try to reduce uh, this loss to follow up and uh, breaks in protocol. And when a patient gets home, I don't know if any of you have had um, you know, loved ones go into, the, go into the hospital and they come home and you try to ask them, you know, what did the doctor tell you? And they have a hard time explaining it. Um, so the ability for a person to get home and call into the system and to be able to hear a summary of what the doctor had said, right? Um, all of this is patient-centered. Again, the technology is allowing us to do it, but it's figuring out how to package these messages for patients themselves. And thinking of the patient as a good target of these systems not just a, a medical provider. Yeah. 
uh, <coughs> what you're describing is a bit like our triage systems we have here, where the moms or dads can call in about problems, particularly for kids. Uh, and there are systems, uh, UNC has one with over 100,000 <coughs> people that call in um, for their kids that are sick. And it's the same sort of thing. It's the end user, and then the, the person on the end, when necessary, either refers them to the emergency room or calls a doctor and says you need to call this person. So the interesting thing about it is when you go to that system from a doctor's office, you get about five to ten times more calls in to the triage line than would have called the doctor because they don't want to call the doctor. They're afraid to call the doctor. You know, whatever I have isn't important enough to call the doctor. But they'll call and talk to the nurse and get reassurance. And some of those did need to call the doctor, and some didn't. So it's kind of interesting. It's really an extension of the same thing. It, it is. We're and we're trying to. If you get your flash part back, that's right. It's exactly what it is. And, and we're trying to get past that myth that just because it's a low resource setting doesn't mean you can't deliver that personalized care. And that links to something that uh, um, you know Mike had asked um, that. Uh, you know, by by delivering this care, um, um, you know, I think we're able to take the screenings uh, to the women in a way that will get them more engaged in in the healthcare system. And it's all about human behavior. Um, here in the U.S., you have women that are mothers and fathers who are reluctant to ask the doctor that question. We're going to experience the same thing in Kenya, where the patients are reluctant to engage with the doctors in that way, and the doctors that are reluctant to engage with patients in a way that's not standard. So if you think it's technology, you're wrong. It's human behavior and interactions, and that's really what we need to study is how to um, package these messages and change user behavior in the healthcare system. I think your fiance is influencing your opinion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always. Always. <laughs> How it's uh, supposed to be. That, that, is, that is what I'm told. <laughs> They're ready. They're ready. That's right. Although the, the tailor this morning tried to talk me out of marriage. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's going to have my pants ready by today, so we're good. <laughs> so. Yeah. I'm curious. You follow you follow up for two years until the infant is two years. Is that for that you follow the mothers, or are you following for child health outcomes? Both. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 I um, I'm really curious to see what the what the user engagement is after two years. Um, how interested the women are in uh, using this system. And again, I think for first time mothers, I think they will be the ones most interested in this system. For women that have been through this four times, I'm not sure our system will bring a whole lot. But we need to see. And this is uh, departing a little bit from that, from all the really eloquent and important points you said about focusing on the mother. But can you talk a little bit about the either your current interactions or sort of potential for using these real-time statistics and real-time monitoring data with health service providers and with health systems in Kenya? And um, because it, you know, that essentially that we we know that in most most of these cases the monitoring data simply don't exist, and if they do, they're really limited or problematic. And this provides a, another form of monitoring data that could get very quickly to authorities to look at, at other issues and, and, and policy mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, de it depends what your um, avenue for data collection is. Like, if you're going to women with phones like this, it's possible to have the information goes immediately into a database and the system can run on that uh, every few seconds. Um, in a healthcare setting, it, it may or may not, it, you know, probably wouldn't make as much sense. You know, I'm I'm the doctor, I'm with you, you're telling me something, I'm putting it into a phone or into a kiosk. Um, nothing needs to happen on that data right away because the doctor is the decision maker, mm -hmm. right? They're the ones that know. Now, out in the field, it could be. If, if, if these systems that um, are reaching, helping community health workers to do their jobs better, right? If they were out in the field and they were entering in a patient's information and the system could analyze that on a regular basis before they leave, that would be the key one. So if you can if you can get the information back to the community health worker before they go that there's a problem, then they could possibly administer a treatment. And some groups like Child Count are trying to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think the the, the match is. And listen, if you are a um, social science person and don't think computer programming is for you, think again. Um, I Eve was a little upset, but I lost uh, about four weekends. Uh, but I figured out how to program 
uh, set up um, R, this stats program, to run on this Amazon server. Um, so aside from losing a little bit of time, I was able to work through it and figure it out. And I've now written the, the analysis code in R. I'd used Stata previously, so it was a transition to R for me. Um, so if, if you think that's not necessarily your forte, stick with it. And I, and I would really recommend that all graduate students really think about developing a tangible skill like that. Um, <laughs> at the Population Council, I hired, uh, in the span of three months, three MPH students. And the ones that I passed on immediately were the ones that just talked about you know, the general knowledge that they gained from an MPH program. I grabbed the ones that said, yes, and I learned how to run uh, this type of regression in Stata. I grabbed another one that said, well, I've been learning how to use uh, GIS. Um, and one that had some advanced work and interventions. They were able to point to something very specific in their training that showed me that they had the drive to learn something else and some practical skills that I could build on. Um, it was very easy to distinguish between students who had that type of background initiative and students that didn't. I'm sure you are all in the category of people I would hire. <laughs> uh, but things like GIS, things like computer programming, um, not that hard. The, the barrier to entry is not that, that tall. All right, thanks, Eric. Thanks. Thank